boy. That wasn't the walk-up music I thought it would be. I was going to have Toto Africa. That's it. Mo, how long have I known you? It's been eight, nine years hanging out. It's a, it's a long time. I think everybody in crypto either, if you've been in it for nine, ten years, you either got, you know, a lot weirder or a lot more normal. And I think it might surprise people to know that actually Mo's gotten more normal. I have a strategy. Everything I know about crypto, I learned in the beginning and then never tried to educate myself more. I mean, I guess it's worked. That's the only way I've maintained any sort of normalcy because the sort of stuff you can see and going on now, while very interesting, it's very, like, there are rabbit holes in the community. You can go down of NFTs and DeFi and everything, and it could take your whole time, take your whole life up. Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually the balanced approach that I've taken to crypto, is to just not have really a life outside of it. <laughs> I mean, at the very least, it's been like a good, it's been a good run, you know, I'm like, so I'm, I'm very young, I'm only 32, but I've been doing this now for like 10 years, and so, you know, if each crypto year is probably like, you know, four to five years of regular life, it's been a long career. <laughs> we're both 80 and 90. Well, my body feels it. Yeah, mine as well. I think we're like the old boomers of crypto at this point. Like you even, I mean, you're wearing glasses. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the conference, I also have a cane. <laughs> I need a mobility wheelchair to go around the conference. Let's talk about blockchain.com for a second. What a success that's been. Uh, for those that don't know, eight years ago, we did a conference in Miami, sitting outside the Clevelander, having a dinner with everybody. Uh, CZ was there as one of the, uh, I think it was a software engineer there. Um, and it was one of the few companies that everybody said, if you walk through the exhibitor hall and you saw blockchain.info, now blockchain.com, you said, these are going to be the, one of the top three companies in the industry. There's so many companies you see, but these things are going to, these ones are going to be the leaders. And, and that's become true. There's been a lot of hard work done by you, Nick, the whole team to make this happen. What has that journey been like in, in seven, eight years? Well, and I think this is one of the things I've learned from being in crypto a long time. There is no like linear path to success in crypto. And uh, the moment you think you like have achieved a quick win, the market will take it back from you. It's a lot of like steady progress is what it is. And it's a lot of perseverance, you know. There were, and you're one of the few people that's been around long enough to remember this. It's not like there weren't other companies in that era. There were hundreds of other companies right. and very, very few survived and are still relevant today, right? If you make the list of companies that were at you know, the first conference, arguably, in Amsterdam, which was eight, nine years ago, and you say are still relevant today, it's probably just us in Coinbase, right? It's hard to think of another one. And, you know, what's kind of kept us centered and kept us successful is a really core focus on a couple of things. The first is operational efficiency. And so we've never really extended past our, you know, financial sort of firepower. And so we've always managed to be, you know, very capital efficient, and that's allowed us to survive a long time. And I think this is a key point that I tell other crypto entrepreneurs and investors, which is like, to be successful in crypto, you have to survive the capital calls, the margin calls, like the down markets, it's easy to make money when the market's going up, but true success in crypto and like skill actually is when the market crashes. And so I don't really believe in any company or any fund in crypto until I see them go up a big wave and down a big wave. Because like now I know who the, you are. The second thing that's really guided us is being very product focused. And so, you know, we really respond to customer demand and to data and so, you know, we're going to build what customers want. We're going to solve those top support tickets. We're not going to sort of like build a bridge into the ocean. We're going to build a 
when we see customer demand. Uh, and then the third thing that I think we've done really well is not be distracted. There's been like sort of endless distractions in mm -hmm. crypto, you know, DLT, new chains, you know, this, that. The reality is that the vast majority of the revenue in our space today is generated by Bitcoin and Ethereum. And we have stayed very focused on Bitcoin originally and then Ethereum because that's where the revenue was. Yeah. Uh, you, you guys have had every opportunity to be opportunistic and have remained focused on building smart products over time that respond to the demand. What started as an information site and a wallet became something and much bigger than it ever intended to be, but you responded to product demand and not just, can we be opportunistic about this? Um, what new products or what... Let me rephrase this. From a product side, you guys have built new products, but you've also been launching in new countries and working on things around the world as well. So it hasn't been just sitting back and watching the, how much runway you have. It's been, where can we expand what makes sense and how do we give back? Yeah, and I mean, we've made some audacious bets as well. I mean, one of them that was very, seems very logical now, but was very controversial at the time, was in building out our institutional business. Yeah. So we started building that in late 17, early 18. There was no institutional marketing crypto at that time. There was only like a little slimmer of interest. And I can tell you it was a deeply unpopular uh, business decision at the time. Um, but obviously we started building that early and so we were very well positioned when the wave of institutional interest came in. And you know, it's now half of our revenue is the institutional wing of the company. And you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of millions of revenue, so it's a very big business. Uh, but that was, you know, a big bet at the time. And so, you know, like right now, we're making a big bet in Latin America because I really believe in Latin America as a big driver in the crypto market. And so we're putting local operations in every country in Latin America. We have 250 employees in Latin America now. Um, and that's like a big greenfield bet for us is we want to figure out payment rails for crypto in LATAM, which is a immense <laughs> and maybe insolvable problem, but we're going to try anyway. It's, it's commendable. And moving the company there and having 250, not moving the company, but having 250 employees there, um, you must also be met with a lot of uh, skepticism and hurdles. And so the team that's handling the political risk and the political lobbying must also be a lot of work. Yeah, you know, we've been engaging with regulators for a long time, and the reality of running a business that's very globally focused is we deal with a lot of regulators beyond the US, yeah. um, and so that's a big team at the company. I think for me, you know, it would be easy to just focus on the EU or focus on the US yeah. where we have big businesses, but the real, like, power of the crypto market is about lowering, lowering barriers and opening up access. And there's a lot of companies that are willing to do Europe and the US. There's not a lot that are willing to invest a lot of money in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in Africa. And I really believe in the 10 year you know, future in those markets. And so for me, it's worth making those investments now. Um, and it's really aligned to, I think, the mission of crypto. And, and I'm very much still a romantic about crypto and, you know, in a way maybe that you're not, that, you know, I'm really here for the leveling barriers, building an open financial system and increasing human freedom. And that's still like why I get up in the morning and, and work 100 hours a week. Um, and so when you come from that mindset and you have a 10 year horizon, which we do, we're very fortunate to have the capital to have a 10 year horizon, you invest in these things that wouldn't make sense if you're just looking to the next quarter. Well, you're also doing. There's like 20 other crypto romantics in the audience. <laughs> yes. I mean, what you're also doing is you're casting a really wide net to capture what's going to happen. Um, what I'm seeing more now is what we saw a few years ago, which is very niche products, very niche companies solving a very specific product rather than this really wide net to bring in as many people as possible and then help them. 
Yeah, and you know, I think it's also a smart business strategy because it builds a big moat. It's very difficult to do a lot of these countries and markets, and it's a lot easier to do the U.S., right? And so there is a, a real business reason to do it as well. It's certainly a motivation. Um, you know, and I think, I think crypto is at a point where over the next three or four years, we have to figure out a way for it to be about more than speculation. I can tell you that if it doesn't make that transition, it's going to be hard for the institutions to stay in it. It's going to be hard for regulators to take it seriously. Like, it can't just be like a casino forever, right? And a lot of the market is dominated by, you know, basically like casino-esque venues and platforms. And so it's one of the biggest challenges and transitions the industry has to make is like generating real value and real utility. I mean, the reason why many institutions weren't getting involved was the volatility, but it seems like everybody has become accustomed to and understood there's going to be volatility with crypto, but the speculation and the alternative currencies is something that they can't get involved with. And that's why the ETFs are really focused on Bitcoin and Ethereum and the other things are not yet mature enough. Will those be mature enough for institutions to take positions in? I don't know if it was the volatility that bothered institutions. I think it was actually the infrastructure. So, you know, how you trade, how you do custody, the fact that like three years ago, prime brokers didn't exist in crypto. Yep. Um, and so we had a lot of clients that came into crypto just because suddenly they could get the same kind of service that they would have gotten in Morgan or Deutsche, but for the crypto market, right? So I don't know if it was volatility because a lot of assets are volatile, like oil is actually more volatile than crypto. I think it was really the infrastructure, which is in the process of being solved. You know, and the alternative coins and all of that, I think that will come over time, but institutional investors are still very wary of a lot of the stuff that's less than three years old. Yeah, infrastructure and there's the regulatory risk that has become more clear over time that people can be involved with. Let's talk about NFTs for a second because everybody is talking about this. You log on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and people are NFTing everything. Um, to get your personal perspective, and then maybe the company perspective, or maybe not, um, what's your take on all this? So my personal perspective is that um, <clears throat> I might be too old to get it. Um, no, I'm kidding. I think, like, I've seen several of these crypto innovation cycles happen now, and usually the first wave of it is, like, kind of... Mm, maybe not so substantive, a little funny, right? And I think there's a little bit of that going on in the NFT space right now where I'm a big believer in the idea and what it could potentially achieve in different contexts over time. I don't know if most of the assets being launched today will have anything near their value four years from now. What's your take so on So that's like an investor perspective on it. From a customer demand perspective, the demand is immense. So, you know, we're, it's very public, we're building a marketplace right now. We've never had a product that had a wait list have as many wait list signups as the NFT marketplace. I mean, it is wild. Like, you're talking, you know, uh, the population of a small country on a wait list, right? And so, um, the demand is insane, and I think that's really interesting. And I love the basic ethos of the NFT world, which is let's put an asset, a unique asset, and have it freely transportable. That's a really powerful idea, and that's something that we want to embrace. But I think, I think consumers need to be very careful about what they're buying in that vertical, because it's hard to see where a lot of the long-term demand comes from for the current assets today, for the JPEGs. I don't know if I'm a huge believer in the JPEGs. You like PNGs. I'm a PNG guy till the end. Maybe even a PDF. I want to corner the market on PDF NFTs. It's my investment strategy currently. You heard it here first. You heard it here. Um, to be really clear, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I like the theory of NFTs becoming this gateway drug for 
getting used to crypto and feeling what it's like to do a transaction for the first time and if it's a method by which people can get familiar with Web3 and using MetaMask to interact with websites and holding some sort of cryptocurrency, that's good because that is, to me, a very good mass market product to get people familiar with crypto. It's, it's always been more difficult to get people to buy Bitcoin to buy Bitcoin. Now you can buy something and you may buy something easier and cheaper and use that and then get involved in the community and then find out more. And that builds a bigger community. Yeah, I think one of the biggest problems with crypto today is actually how hard it is to do something crypto. Yes. Um, like when you and I got involved, I think Bitcoin transactions were like half a penny. Uh, you know, and like I remember the ETH guys making fun of the Bit guys, Bitcoin guys for dollar transactions. You know, I, it's really hard to actually just do something in crypto now, you know, from just a fee perspective. And so to the extent that NFTs or newer protocols, you know, like Near or Phantom or Solana can help with that, I think that's huge. Um, and I do love the fact that with an NFT, it can be a lot more fun. Right, and so I'm seeing some of the stuff that, you know, we're doing in our NFT project, and like, it's really fun. You know, it's like, uh, particularly after this many years of Bitcoin, it's nice to like see some fun again. It, Dogecoin had that in the beginning. What was funny is that Dogecoin was was really hard. Jackson Palmer left the project, and then things got really weird with Dogecoin, and then after. Now it's becoming just as fun as the Shiba and all the other tokens. Um, what's I actually <clears throat> have a really good Dogecoin origin story. I acquired my Dogecoin stash by selling someone half a dozen beach balls. I'm not kidding. Um, and I think they may be the most expensive beach balls in human history now. Because it was like a couple months after Dogecoin launched. So it, it, there are many doges for those, for those beach balls. And I did it at the time because I was like, you know, my story of how I got my first Bitcoins is like not that good. And I was like, I'm going to make this story fucking good. <laughs> and so I've always hoped Doge would be really successful so that I could like have a good origin story. Now you have it. What's your Shiba origin story? I actually own zero Shibas. At some point, I was been in crypto so long that like, I don't really, to be honest, like go on and like trade and buy meme coins anymore. You know, it's like I'm too old for that shit. <laughs> like you know, I think the last there's like uh, crypto charts. I think your first three or four years in crypto, you're really interested in crypto charts, and then after that, you just like are like fuck, I can't, just can't look at charts anymore. <laughs> and, you know, this is coming from a guy that built, like, a lot of the original charts for Bitcoin. But after three or four years, I was like, ugh, charts. Hmm? <laughs> Di Venn diagrams of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's like, that's how you know you've been around a while, is you just can't do it. Like, when do you look at charts? When, when they're on stage. <laughs> I see a chart on stage now, and I'm like, um, it, it's important to see. I mean, for sure, not price charts, but to see uh, sort of the money supply and some other things. These are interesting to see visualized, but still, I fall asleep real quick. You know, and I mean, here's the other kind of ironic thing: is like, I know a lot of the, you know, if you're to make a list of the five investors who have made the most money in cryptocurrency, I, I probably know at least three of them, maybe four. <clears throat> And, like, none of them are traders. They just, like, slowly bought coins and didn't sell them. And I can tell you, I have, you know, millions and millions of data points about consumers. And I can tell you that as a consumer, your number one trading strategy is just, like, buy some of the top three or four coins slowly, month by month, and don't sell them for four or five years. The problem is that no one believes you when you say that because it just sounds too simple and frankly like not enough work and people are like I want to get out and I want to like see the oscillator chart and then like the reverse this and then like you know 
You know about the head and shoulders and the cup and... The head and shoulders, the flying wedge. <laughs> I'm like, is this football or is this... Anyway, but um, it's just another old man crypto thing. Uh, but I, I think that has remained true by slowly over time and you should be good. I mean, it, yeah. So, so far it's been working. So far it's been working and that's the only investment strategy in crypto that like has consistently worked. Yeah. yeah but, uh, <laughs> Do you think we could make a chart for that though? <laughs> how many people buy slowly over time? How, they've, how their portfolios have done versus how many people trade and how their portfolios have done. Maybe I'll come out of chart retirement. <laughs> one final chart. Um, which no one would like. Uh, that would be good. We'll see how, how, switching gears for a second, like what happened with ICOs is that governments started regulating that real quick because governments have an inherent I, I actually don't think that's what happened to ICOs. There, there was a whole lot of nonsense, but the point I'm trying to make is that the governments tried to protect citizens from being exposed to um, risk. And I'm not sure what happens with NFTs. I'm not sure if the governments will take... It, it seems all fun and games, but there is enough money being involved in NFTs right now that some governments might take a more measured approach to this and say, well, hold up, you can't have your NFTs in this country, you can't launch your exchange in this country. Do you see any of that? No, and I mean, what really happened to ICOs, because all the exchanges doing ICOs or IDOs or whatever were offshore, unregulated venues anyway, it, it just was that like they stopped working because they were losing money for investors, right? Like the best ICO of all time was the ETH crowd sale, and then it kind of went downhill from there. So that's why ICOs dried up more than any other reason. I think with NFTs, you know, for regulators to regulate the NFT markets, they also have to regulate the collectible market and the art market. And I think that's maybe possible, but there's a lot of entrenched entrance around that stuff. What you will see in the NFT market, and you already see this, like regulators are already cracking down on this, is money laundering. You know, because money, anti-money laundering really, you know, it applies to everything. It applies to buying cars, it applies to buying houses, it applies to buying watches. Like, you know, anti-money rule, laundering rules, they know no bounds. And so that will get applied to the NFT marketplace. But I don't think that, like, you know, a lot of other regulation will get applied to the NFT space. What's your take on the valuations of some of these marketplaces? And what the hell is going on here? Because OpenSea raises a new round every 30 minutes. And so there's one investor in the NFT space that's just very bullish on NFTs. It's like one growth fund. And they just keep putting money into the uh, NFT marketplaces. And they're either like brilliant or just, you know, going to suffer some losses in the NFT space. I don't know if we really know yet. I think... Look, like every time there's a hot new category in crypto, investors get euphorically excited about it. And sometimes it works out for them and sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, a lot of people, for example, piled money into the, you know, there were some successful ICOs. Let's talk about ICOs. There's some successful ICOs. And then VC investors started just piling into ICOs, right? And the last three or four ICO deals that investors did, they, they lost money on and hard because they like piled in ahead of there actually being any value there. I think there's a lot of value in what OpenSea has built and that team's incredible. I, you know, I think that we have to see just like the standard, you know, old man crypto boomer test, what happens to these NFT marketplaces because they're like here right now, what happens here, yeah. right? And I don't really know because the NFT space is new. Maybe the NFTs never suffer a drawback. Um, but I do know that there's a lot of competition coming for OpenSea and the other NFT yeah. marketplaces. There's a lot of people building the same product because it isn't a super difficult product to build. It isn't super difficult to build. And I think a lot of folks probably 
you know, it's, all these assets live on an open blockchain anyway. You had to figure out how to ingest and index all of that, which was difficult, like a technical challenge, but it looked, it's like a five to eight month technical challenge. Everybody started working on it about four months ago. So the next four months are gonna get interesting from that perspective. And there's a lot of platforms in crypto that have a lot of consumers signed up. We have like 35 million verified users. Coinbase has, I think, 50 something. We're both launching NFT marketplaces, right? I think it's some stat like six or 700,000 people have ever interacted with an NFT via OpenSea. Let's bring up that chart. Yeah, where's that chart? <laughs> um, which is a lot of people, right? But is not 30 or 50 million. Correct. Yeah, I, I mean, the project's not difficult to make. The, the, the curation, the aggregation, the serving the right things to the right customers is great, but there aren't enough customers. But I mean, the people that are investing in OpenSea at these valuations must be thinking there's an exit here, and to have a publicly listed NFT marketplace might be on the table sometime. Yeah, maybe. Um, that would be very cool. So that could be that could be quite interesting. I think. Look, I think the big thing that OpenSea can do that would be very cool is become like the central clearinghouse for NFTs. You know, like open up their platform, release really great developer APIs, and just make it easy for everyone to do NFTs via OpenSea. Um, and they haven't done that yet, but I think that would be a really cool business strategy. Um, I do think that NFTs on other chains, though, is gonna be the big trend this year for the NFT marketplace. Like, I don't, I think right now it's like 80% of volume is on the ETH chain. Doesn't make sense. And it's really dumb. It's like, why? Uh, you don't need high security to secure your, you know, your NFT that you randomly generated. You know, so I think, you know, by the end of this year, it'll be, you know, maybe 30, 40% on Ethereum. And the big question is like, which chain will be the big winner out of that? It's, it's true. It, it, it doesn't make sense to have the gas fees in Ethereum. It doesn't make sense because you don't need that much security and you just need to process transactions. And you want it to be fun. NFTs are supposed to be fun. You know, and, and the last NFT I bought on OpenSea, the transaction fee cost more than the NFT. And I was like, oh boy. You know? Yeah. It's, it's just sad. That's true. And what, honestly, when, when we got involved in crypto, Bitcoin was fun. I'm here to tell you guys that it, long, long ago, Bitcoin was fun. <laughs> I know that seems weird. And maybe like I'm lying, but it's true. It's, it was a band of outsiders trying to say, we have a solution here that might work. None of us are certain this thing will work. And everybody that knows anything about it says it's an experiment. But we think it could work. And we're just having a good time with friends. And now it's turned into a completely different monster. But back then, it was the Dogecoin NFT. I mean, so one of the things like that I like, so there was like hackathons back then and like, you know, one of the things that got built in the hackathon was a chat app where you chatted by like sending messages in the opcode. Like that was the thing because it was so cheap. Like, and it was actually really fast. You, you like Bitcoin transactions cleared in like a minute. Well, there was change tip, which worked as a tipping method for Reddit. Oh, yeah, change Twitter. tip. That was a great application where no matter what, you can just send people Bitcoin on Twitter, on Reddit, whatever, just to support people. And there was no $500 fee to send that change tip. I totally forgot about that. It's a good company. So that's like my big goal this year is like make crypto fun. Make crypto fun again. We'll get some hats. Yeah. Make no, yeah, you should be excited about that. And I think that kind of comes down to everybody, you know, building products that are fun, taking it a little less seriously, and frankly just being like a little less greedy. Like, if crypto is fun and usable, 
and generates value for people, it's going to be way more valuable in the future. So my kind of encouragement to the community a lot of times in, is like, well, let's focus on that. Because that is like kind of what catapulted us in the early days was like, it was very inclusive, very fun, you know, and just was focused on people. And I think that sometimes, you know, with all the charts and the markets and the, you know, potential riches, people forget about that. Um, and that's in many ways, like when I look back on my very long career in crypto at this point, that's the part that I like treasure the most is, you know, it's people like, you know, Mo that I've known for a long time and had a lot of fun adventures with and, and the people that you've been able to bring in and the products you've been able to build. And that's what's really special about crypto. Let's end with that. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks, guys. Peter and Mo.